Hi class, Rachel Chase here, and welcome back to our final video of Chapter 3, where we talk about measures of relative standing. These are also known as measures of position, since they give us perspective as to where our data fits within, with respect to the rest of it. So some examples you may have seen before regarding measures of position are things like percentiles, um, and also what we're going to talk about here are z-scores. So this is going to tie back in pretty heavily to the empirical rule that we had talked about in our last video together. So what is a z-score used for? A z-score is a way for us to, to find out exactly how many standard deviations away from the mean something is. So why might this be useful? So the, primarily, the reason for this is it tells you, does our data fit above or below the mean? Um, and more specifically, is it one standard deviation away, two standard deviations, or does it maybe fall in between those in some way? So if a z-score tells you how many standard deviations away the data falls, it is totally possible to have something like 1.27 standard deviations. Whereas if you're using the empirical rule, you're implying on whole standard deviations only. So again, this deals with exactly how many, and it can be any number. A general rule of thumb, which you'll see consistently through this course, is that we round z-scores to roughly two places each time. It really depends on the application, but it's usually two. So two decimal places. Let's look at an example, and then we'll refer back to what we had talked about with the empirical rule. On a particular exam, the average test score is a 91 with a standard deviation of 4.5 points. Would it be unusual for a student to score a 99 on this exam? So this tells us that we have a mean test score of 91 with a standard deviation of 4.5. The piece that they tell us in here, and you'll notice our z-score formulas, are the difference between the data value and the mean divided by the standard deviation, whether it's population data or sample data. It's the same consistent values. Would it be unusual for that student to score a 99 on the exam? So this 99 right here represents the data value that we are comparing it to. So to plug in, we have z equals, so we have our x value of 99 minus 91, divide that by our standard deviation, which gives us 8 over 4.5, which is 1.7 repeating. So to round this, you're going to take that to two places, which is 1.78. Now, the determination for a data value being unusual or unlikely is anything that is more than two standard deviations away from the mean. So if you have a z-score that is greater than 2 or less than negative 2, that's considered unusual. A z-score of 1.78 is perfectly likely to occur. So no, this is not unusual. What if instead we have a data value that's now smaller than the mean? The only difference is that our z-score ends up being negative. So we plug in 87 minus 91 divide by 4.5 is going to give us negative 0.8 repeating, which rounds to negative 0.89. Negative 0.89 is not smaller than negative 2, so this also is not an unusual value. Again, it has to be greater than positive 2 or less than negative 2 to fit the unusual, unlikely category. So. Let's think back to what we talked about with the empirical rule the other day. If we look at the empirical rule, it shows us that we are the mean plus 1, 2, 3 standard deviations, minus 1, 2, 3 standard deviations. So with this data, if we had a z-score of 1, a z-score of 1 would be exactly on this line. z-score of 2, exactly on this line. Negative 2, exactly on this line. Why is that significant to us? Well, you'll notice that a z-score of 0, because that's 0 standard deviations away, is always dead center. So negative z-scores are on the left, positive z-scores on the right. So what if I asked you something like, is it unlikely for someone to score a 97% on the test? We can find the z-score based on the information we have here. We have z equals 
97 minus 87.2 divided by 8.1. This gives us a z-score of 1.21 when we round. So a score of 97 is not considered unlikely at all because it would fit somewhere around here, which is only a little bit more than one standard deviation away. On the other hand, if I said, okay, well, would it be unlikely for someone to score 65 on the test? So lands over here. Find the z-score. We have 65 minus 87.2 divided by 8.1. This is a z-score of negative 2.74, which, according to our rules, that is more than two standard deviations away. It's pretty close to three standard deviations, so right around here. That makes this unlikely. So to try and color code things, we can say that anything beyond two on either side is considered unlikely. The other measurement that we use for position are dealing with things like percentiles. In the next part of this video, we will explore those. Calculating percentiles are in some ways very similar to dealing with the, the normal curve and the empirical rule, only in terms of the, the normal curve, we go from 0 up to 100, and the middle value where it splits symmetrically is always the 50th percentile. So that correlates to the median of our value. Remember, when the data is normally distributed with that bell curve, the mean, median, and mode are all dead center in the data. So let's explore percentiles a little further. To calculate a percentile from a data value, it's always the number of items that happened before divided by the total number of values times 100. The reason for that is a percentile value tells you for example, if it's a test score and I score in the 75th percentile, it means that I have scored better than 75% of everybody who took it. So take, for example, let's say we want to know what percentile is the 3 in. So I go up to my data, and I see that there is only one piece of data to the left. So the percentile of the 3 is equal to 1 out of, we have a total of, eight numbers here. So n is equal to eight. So it's one out of eight times 100 percent, which is the 12 and a half percentile. And you could repeat this really for any of them. If you have repeated numbers, like with the four, you would count up from the first value of that number. So the first value of the repeated. So let's do one more of these. Uh, what is the percentile of the number 17? So we have five numbers that come before it. So it's five out of our total times 100%, which gives us 62.5 percentile. That means that 62.5% of the data falls before the number 17 in our list. Now, if instead you want to find out what value corresponds to a certain percentile, we use the location formula. For this, this is one that's provided on your formula sheet. We can say the location of percentile P is equal to the percent out of 100 times our sample size. So again, this is the location of the percentile. Now, the reason I emphasize that this is the location is because that itself is not the data value, whatever you get. So once you find this, there's one more step. So if I want to know where does the, let's say, 30th percentile occur. So to do this, I start with my location formula. L30 is equal to 30 out of 100 times n is 8, which gives us 2.4. There's two different situations that can occur. If you have a location 
that is a decimal, these are actually the easier ones to manage. You immediately round that up to the next whole number. So 2.4, we would round that up to 3. And then back in our data set, we're going to count from the beginning. This is 1, 2, 3. So whatever number that is, that third number there is 4. We can say that the 30th percentile occurs at the number 4. Now, if instead you have a whole number here, which we'll explore in one of our next examples, there, it does require a little bit extra of a step. A few other words that are notable, just vocabulary-wise, are quartiles. Anytime you hear court, you should think four. So your quartiles, Q1, is the 25th percentile. Q2 is the same thing as the median, which is 50%. And lastly, Q3 is our 75th percentile. Decile, anytime you see deci, you think 10. So for example, D3 would be the 30th percentile. D7 is the 70th percentile. So this counts in tens. And one of the last things that's important here is called the interquartile range. The interquartile range is simply subtracting the third quartile minus the first quartile. So you're finding the distance between the first and the third quartiles. Next, let's explore what happens when we have a whole number come up as our location value. So given the following test scores, find each of the following. So we have here the 50th percentile and the 70th percentile. So to find the 50th percentile first, find the location of 50, so that's 50 over 100 times we have here 10 test scores, which is going to give us 5. So that means that the 50th percentile will occur somewhere between the 5th and 6th values in the list. So if I count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are right here. If it occurs somewhere between them, like we've done before, you're going to take the mean. So add 88 plus 89 together and divide that by 2, which gives us 88.5. So we can say that 88.5 is where the 50th percentile occurs. Repeat that process just to try one more here. The location of the 70th percentile, 70 over 100 times 10, it's going to give us 7, which means that the percentile occurs somewhere between the 7th and 8th values. So if we count in, we have our 5, 6, 7th, and 8th numbers. So that's between 89 and 91. So we go ahead and take the mean. 89 plus 91 divided by 2 gives us a 90 being where the 70th percentile occurs. Now, box or percentiles are often used in terms of um, basically a, a measure of position. So it tells you how that piece of data fits with respect to the rest of it. If it's over 50%, that means that you've surpassed the mean of that data and the median of that data. If it's under the median, again, it gives you a position. It's to the left of those values. We can also use a visual, which is our box plot, to describe what's occurring with our information. So let's take a moment and talk about what a box plot is comprised of. Box plots are constructed using what we call a five number summary. Sometimes this is called a five point summary. The five number or point summary is uh, comprised of the minimum, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the maximum. So from our data set here, we can very quickly, since it's already listed in order for us, find our min and our max. We have a minimum of 14 and a maximum of 29. Now, as far as how you go about finding your median, you could use the techniques that we've already learned about earlier in this chapter, or instead, you could use the 50th percentile and find the location formula from there. So I would say it's usually easiest just to cross off until you find the center which, by doing that, we'll get a median of 19. For practice, let's take a look at calculating the first and third quartiles. Q1, remember, is the 25th percentile. 
So first we have to find the location of the 25th percentile, which is equal to 25 over 100 times we have a total of, let's count them up, 31 pieces of data. Then we also need to find the 75th percentile. So we do that using 75 over 100 times 31. By plugging in, we get that the location of the 25th percentile occurs at 7.75. Because it's a decimal, we round up to a whole number and count. We have 5, 6, 7, 8. So this 17 is going to be our first quartile. When we plug in for the 75th percentile, we get 23.25. Of course, decimal, round that up to the next whole number, 24. So we have 5, 10, 15, 20. 24 is our value of 20 here. So once you have your five number summary, this is where the box plot aspect comes in. For this, it's essentially a box with two spanning whiskers off of it. So sometimes you'll hear these even called box and whisker plots. Now, what I advise doing, and this is something that I would recommend with caution, is if you're not sure of how to scale your values, take a moment and create yourself a number line that you can always erase later. Now that we have our number line put together, what you first do is look at your, your quartiles and your median. So you're going to look at that middle 75%. This is where the box component comes in. We have a first quartile of 17, so I'm going to make a mark there. A median of 19, mark it again. And then our third quartile of 20. And this is the box component, so we're going to square that all off. Then, the tail pieces, those whiskers, are for your minimum and your maximum. We have a minimum at 14, so I'm going to connect that back, and a maximum at 29, also connecting that back. So the expectation here is you should have your five number summary listed and then your box plot drawn. If you do not have the numbers listed up here, then be sure to include what those are on top. So we have 14, 17, 19, 20, and 29. So this is going to give us a little bit of a visual of what our data looks like. We can see that we have a much smaller gap between our minimum and our first quartile than we do with our third quartile and our maximum. And that's actually where the conversation about outliers comes in. So using a box plot and using this information, is there a way for us to identify any outliers that might exist? The answer to that is yes. So when looking for outliers, we can identify if there are lower outliers or upper outliers. There's really no difference between the two in terms of what they are. It's just how we calculate them. Our lower outliers are anything that is smaller than our first quartile minus one and a half times the interquartile range. And the upper outliers, it's a little bit different than that, but the formula is generally the same, is the third quartile now plus one and a half times the interquartile range. If you recall from our definitions page, the interquartile range is equal to Q3 minus Q1. So with our set of data that we just calculated, let's just move over what we had. We found that the first quartile was at 17 and the third quartile was at 20. That gives us an interquartile range of 20 minus 17 is 3. So let's identify if any outliers exist in our data. We have lower outliers if our numbers are smaller than 17 minus 1.5 times 3. 1.5 times 3 is 4.5. 17 minus 4.5 is 12.5. Now repeat that for the upper side. Anything greater than 20 plus 1.5 times our interquartile range of 3. So that is 20 plus 4.5 
which gives us 24.5. So anything smaller than 12.5 or bigger than 24.5 is considered an outlier. So if we go back to our data here, we can see we don't have anything smaller than 12.5, but instead if we look at that 24.5, well, we have 24 and then we jump up to a 29. So that means that based on this data, 29 is in fact an outlier. The last thing to really say in terms of box plots, what we can do about that, is oftentimes if an outlier exists, we'll actually put a little x. This is something I know that Excel does and other forms of technology. And that implies that, yeah, you know, it is the maximum or it is one of the values, but we do in fact have an outlier here. So it's just to do an extra identifying piece of information there. Thank you for watching.